Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, very good. Thank you for joining us today for what I think will be a, a fantastically interesting panel. Um, we've got a wonderful set of uh, panelists. Um, Trista Chen, Head of Stewardship here at LGM in Asia. Um, Harry Cho, a good friend of um, GFANS, uh, but CSO at SGX, um, and also a member of the TNFD, as well as a member of the GFANS steering group, group, and Ben Caldercott, founding director of CGFI, the Center for Greening Finance um, and Investment, founding director of Oxford Sustainable Finance Group, and co-head of the Transition Plan Task Force. So we're going to be talking today about net zero transition plans and all the progress that has been made over the last few years. My name is Alex Mickey. I'm the head of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero uh, Secretariat. Um, GFANS delivered a transition plan framework to COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh last year that was produced by over 20 financial institutions that was co-chaired by uh, Noel Quinn, um, and Amanda Blanc. For those who don't know um, GFANS, um, we now have over 650 financial institutions from over 50 countries, all committed to net zero. And many of those financial institutions have this year, for the first time, published their net zero transition plans. I hope some of those uh, are sat in the audience. Um, for those who have done so, congratulations. Well done. For those who haven't done so, we look forward to reading yours uh, in the coming months and years. Um, so, Trista, let me start with you, given we're at PRI, and LGM is one of the world's largest investors. So, how has LGM used the Net Zero Transition Planning Framework, um, both as a company yourself, but also to engage with your portfolio companies? Sure. Thanks, Alex. I'm very happy to be here. So as Alex mentioned that we were in general investment management with one of the largest global asset management fund, and we see it as a subsidiary of our group company, Legal in general. So the um, climate transition plan that we have published is at a group level that uh, in uh, released earlier this year. So with our um, strong belief in inclusive capitalism that drive us to act, we also have a strong track record in delivering that. So the transition plan basically highlights what are the focus areas and commitments, including matrix and time Markets, corporate governance, and also the risk area that we have outlined. Um, so essentially, our plan highlights the three areas that we are committed to drive our climate transition. And the first one is related to what um, the way we invest. So we will incorporate climate in how we invest into our 81.6 billion pounds of proprietary um, asset. And we also have set very specific target in reducing the intensity of our finance emission net zero asset portfolio to be aligned with net zero 1.5. Um, Paris objective with an 18.5 reduction emission intensity by 2025 and then a continuously 50% reduction by 2030. Um, and to support that, we will also continue to invest in technology and infrastructure solutions that we believe can drive the low carbon economy transition and then to manage the more resilient climate risk. The second way is where I come from, more from the LGM perspective, um, and see how we are able to influence as one of the largest um, asset managers, using our influence to drive um, uh, the, the transition to net zero with a total of 1.2 trillion AUM of um, British pounds. So this is first through the products we offer to our clients. Um, we are targeting a 70% of AUM to achieve or to be aligned with net zero by 2030 and then also continue to work with our clients to reach the net zero by 2050 or sooner across all the AUM. And then the second part is a very important focus of the work that our team has been doing, is to engage with the real economies, with companies that we engage, invest in, and also through government bodies, policymakers, peers, to support a 1.5 net zero pathway. And last but not the least, we also have, of course, have looked into the way we operate. Um, we also have a set a target to reduce our own scope one and two emission by 42% 2030. I think most of the important part from where I'm coming from within the LGM's investment stewardship team is the continued conversation that we act on behalf of clients to drive the fragility duty through our stewardship activity. And I think in particular to be, have the confidence that we are able to continue the journey progress to make that transition, um, I can share a few examples of how we do that. 
I think one of the um, uh, strong cases that LGM has been making is our long-term commitment on Climate Impact Pledge. And this starts from the program, a campaign that we've launched in 2016 called the LGM's Climate Impact Pledge. Um, and so far, we have been just starting the ACE cycle um, at, uh, at the beginning of uh, the fourth season. And last year, we have uh, extended our sectoral um, expectation, including the red line that we expect on companies when we do engagement to a total of 20 sectors. And all the sectoral information are published on our website. And from that, we also do data-driven assessment around a global of 5,000 companies from uh, our total corporate holding. And we use both quantitative and qualitative measures. Um, and then we use the traffic light system identifying how the company's uh, disclosure performance based on the independent data they publish that we rely on third party to, to draw in with the traffic light system. So for companies that they can go to our website and then look at how their performance with respect to um, the TCFD four pillar, so you can see the good ones will be identified as green, amber, and red, right? So it's very transparent for companies to see where their disclosure performance with regard to our net zero expectation on them. Um, and then on top of that, we also do um, in-depth, deep engagement one-on-one -on -one with conversation uh, with companies. And last year, um, I think believe this year moving forward also, we will have um, 105 companies that we will have direct conversation with. And that is on top of the other collaborative engagement we do, for example, the CA100+, plus, the 11i100 uh, net zero commitment, um, and then the CDP non-disclosure. And then also we recently joined AIGC, et cetera. So you can see that it's a very targeted and intense engagement program that we have been running um, to directly um, communicate our expectation to company for the specific sector that what we want them to achieve for net zero and how their performance uh, are aligned with our, our, our red line. And I think one thing LGM is pretty known for is our engagement with consequence. That means after a period of time through the engagement, should a company not able to meet some of the red line, depending on the region, because we do recognize the maturity from developed market and emerging market will be different, we may subject to hold the company accountable. And this can be through vote against the chair of the board or withhold the right to divest. So if you look at our latest report published in July, um, we have uh, 14 companies current on the divestment list. But divestment is not the intention, right? So I think this year's report, we also highlight a very positive um, case study of China Mengniu Dairy that through years of engagement, they have um, disclosed their deforestation policy. They also have made their 2050 carbon neutrality commitment. And then they also have met the red line that we've sent. So we have since removed them from the divestment list. So we want to send a very strong positive signal to the market that we are um, looking at how we want to work with the company to understand the challenge and opportunity they will face together with us in the net zero journey. Yeah, so that's just one example. We of course have the thermal coal policy, um, oil sand policy, and also our latest version of the deforestation policy. Mm -hmm. So now we have, um, uh, I think last year we, up, we released the first version. So now we have the second version, uh, further strengthen our expectation on deforestation. So we understand we're not able to um, tackle climate change without addressing deforestation from the morning panel that we've heard. So this again, um, all our engagement activities is a thematic lead. So together now, LGM has six super theme. Um, it can range from climate, nature, people, health, governance, and digitization, and a total of 21 sub theme. So we look at how um, the theme will overlap with each other that can be specific for a sector, specific for a region, and then we will carry out engagement activity together. So okay. I think just, just some highlight of um, a, a really wide range of activities that we've been committed and driving um, our own net zero commitment as, a, as an asset manager. Yeah, That's great. Pause here. Thanks. So you mentioned um, TCFD. Yeah. So um, a lot of the people who are involved with the Task Force for Climate Rated Financial Disclosures, myself when I was at the Bank of England, my current boss, Mary Shapiro, her boss, Mike Bloomberg, my then boss, Mark Carney, were all involved in the TCFD. And we we're quite um, deliberate about how the GFAN's Net Zero Transition Plan framework builds off the TCFD. Yeah. So if you're used to publishing TCFD, it should be very familiar to you yes. to use a GFAN's framework to publish a Net Zero Transition Plan. The other thing about the TCFD that we took um, 
a lot of inspiration from was actually the theory of change. Um, so the TCFD was a private sector-led initiative that developed, identified, articulated best practice, and then over time um, was put into standards. So Ben and I were both involved with um, COP26. At COP26, the ISSB was launched, which has just this year uh, taken on control and, and running of the TCS. TCFD from now on. So I want to just use that, Ben. We take inspiration for that at, at GFANS. And another thing we did together when we were at COP26 was launch the Transition Plan Task Force. So I think this is a quite a hopeful sign that we're seeing that TCFD journey from private sector-led identification of best practice into adoption over time um, of standards and regulation, but hopefully not on a 10-year time horizon. So we published a transition plan framework last year, and already the TPT is taking up the mantle um, in the UK. So can you tell us a little bit about how the UK is, and the transition plan task force is taken forward transition plan from a standard setting perspective? Sure, very happy to do that, Alex. And um, and thank you for your personal leadership on this, this issue, and also, of course, the, the leadership that GFANS has played in, in all of this. So let me tell you a bit about um, the transition plan task force, what's going on in the UK, and I think how the the, what we're doing through the task force is relevant to what's going on here in Japan, but also internationally. Um, so the context running up to COP26 and at COP26, Alex and, and others very successfully mobilizing lots of uh, ambitious net zero commitments from financial institutions, but also from real economy actors. And there's a sense that um, some of those commitments might not be sufficiently credible, that we needed um, a plan for delivery um, and action and obviously, that's a theme for, for this conference. Um, and there's a view, uh, which I think we many of us agree with, that to, to, to do that, to have credible net zero commitments, you need transition plans. And further, um, you have people talking about transition finance. Um, I don't think you can have transition finance without transition plans. So those are some of the reasons why um, this sort of got onto the agenda for, for COP26. And the UK announced there that um, a couple of things. One is that there would be mandatory transition plan disclosures as part of something called the sustainability disclosure requirements that we're introducing in the UK that cover net zero, but also other sustainability issues. And that we'd also establish a task force, um, the TPT, that would essentially define what best practice transition plans should look like, um, because that's something that hasn't been properly defined uh, yet we're making rapid progress, building on the work of, of GFANS and, and others. But th this was something that the, the market needed, market participants needed. Um, just quick, just a, a point on um, UK mandatory transition plan requirements. So as of uh, the accounting period from January 2022, um, that was introduced on a comply explain basis. Um, from accounting period starting January 2025, it's going to be mandatory for large companies, not just listed companies, and that's being introduced through two routes. The first route is through um, the FCA and the, the endorsement bringing into force of the ISSB into the, into the UK framework, regulatory, regulatory framework, and then the government's also announced it's going to consult to uh, update, revise the Companies Act to include in scope uh, large companies that aren't, aren't listed. So the TPT, um, practitioner-led process, multi-stakeholder multi process, over 100 different organizations, many of which are, are here, um, involved in creating the, the framework that we're going to publish on Monday in London, as well as various other outputs that I can say more about guidance, sector-neutral guidance, but also sector-specific guidance. Um, and we've put a lot of effort to make sure that this is designed um, to be consistent with existing frameworks. Um, so we've been working very closely with GFANS, Alex's team, um, but also with the ISSB. Um, so we build off the five elements in the GFANS disclosure guidance that was, or the TPT guidance that was published at Sharm El Sheikh. Um, and uh, this, it's designed to support uh, IFRS S2 compliance as, as well. It's also been designed for global adoption. So although it's been designed and set up by the UK. Uh, we've designed it so that it can be used anywhere. We've also involved a whole range of uh, regulatory agencies in other jurisdictions, um, and some of those have been formal observers. Some of those relationships have been informal. Um, one of the key kind of conceptual leaps here that I think I just wanted to underline is that um, we emphasize that transition plans should take a strategic and rounded approach. Now, what does that, that mean? Um, it means that we need to think about this not just about the entities 
plan for decarbonisation, we also need to think about how the entity is contributing to wider societal decarbonisation and the levers that those entities have to support that. Um, and that's the big conceptual leap, the difference between some of the things that have, have gone before. Um, the other thing to emphasise is that uh, transition plans will have many users and many use cases. Um, and I think we'll, this, will, this will drive adoption uh, around the world and in different contexts. So it's not just about um, listed companies disclosing. I think you'll see this being used. I mentioned transition finance. It'll be used to underpin sustainability linked instruments. For example, it'll be used obviously for engagement purposes. It will be used in public procurement. You know, you want a contract with the government. You know, where's your transition plan? Oh, you want, and it'll be, it'll be used, I think, also to determine eligibility for, for subsidies and for public finance. You, do you want a, a loan from a, a public development bank? Well, what's, what's your transition plan, for example? Um, and and I, I think we're going to see, see these being used in a variety of different contexts. Um, and, I, and I also think it's worth flagging the fact that a lot of international processes are looking at this simultaneously. So um, you've got IOSCO looking at this, you've got um, the NGFS, the Basel Committee, the G20 FSB, the G7. Um, so there's an awful lot of work going on and it, we're all trying to make sure it's connected, that you don't have um, yet another thing that is new and complicated, that this actually builds off existing work that's been done. I think that point on integration is really important. Um, if you're an asset manager, you will um, you can join GFANS through the Net Zero Asset Managers Alliance, as Algem has, which I think this year is being run by PRI, taking over from IIGCC and Series. Um, some of you may be familiar with the um, ICAPs, the Climate Action Plans invest that the Investor Agenda run. They're integrated with the GFANS Transition Plan Framework, and I think the, the integration between TPT and the GFANS is really important. I think the more that practitioners, investors, asset owners, um, including at the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, publish and, and cite common frameworks, the more impetus it gives to regulators around the world to create at least interoperability, if not common um, disclosure requirements in this space. And you heard the Japanese Prime Minister yesterday on this stage, uh, we're honored to be sat basically where he was, um, say that Japan, um, in the context of the uh, GX um, consortium and GFANS will be looking at this issue um, next year, which is fantastic um, news and fantastic progress. Harry, um, that point that Ben just made about this being a strategic tool about your company's role in the broader societal transition, I think is important. Um, Harry was really instrumental in, in setting up the Net Zero Financial Service Providers Alliance, which um, links to that because if you think about what it means for a bank or an investor to commit to net zero, their scope of one and two emissions take a bank or less than 0.1% of their financed emissions. So if they're committing to net zero on a scope three basis, which they are, if they're in, in GFANS, they have to completely transform how their business works, how they operate, what they're invested in, how they work with their clients and companies. Um, so the innovation of the Net Zero Financial Service Providers Alliance was to say, okay, we're an exchange or we're an index provider. We're not just talking about our employees uh, walking to work or running our exchange on renewable energy. We're talking about how, what is our role in decarbonizing the financial industry, the real economy, etc. So um, well done for that. Can you talk from a... Um, financial service providers and exchange provider, how are you thinking about your own net zero transition plan? And linking back to how it integrates potentially with the ISSB going forward. Thanks, Alex. And I'm um, really delighted to be here today with you all. Um, uh, perhaps it's worth just sharing a little bit about, um, I mean, exchange is a little bit of uh, funny animals in the sense that depending on um, jurisdiction, the way that the governance and the mandate of an exchange differs quite significantly. So in our instance, for example, we are all of a listed company um, that runs business as a multi-asset class. So um, typically people think of exchanges from cash securities market, but we have derivatives, fixed income, 
um, uh, commodities derivatives, um, data index business, carbon markets, among other. And thirdly, um, we are, with a strict Chinese wall between the business and the regulatory side, we are also the frontline regulator for what happens in our markets. Um, so... I hope what I share would also help you engage with exchanges who can be a key focal point, a leverage factor in every market. Um, so how are we looking at um, transition plan um, overall? So it does need to cut across all of these components that I've just mentioned. Um, so broadly speaking, it gets split into two for exchanges, and this is why we were quite keen to be one of the founding members to help drive um, the thinking behind how exchanges should think about transition plans and net zero targets and commitments. So on the exchange um, as a company or entity perspective, um, scope three, by the way, for exchanges does not include the emissions of companies who are operating on the exchange. Okay, so the emissions by purely one to three, it's quite small. But this is then where the end at FSPA comes in because now you're committing to align your relevant services and products to net zero. So then just to focus on um, as an entity first, um, of course, all the targets, but all the, you know, the, the, the work that needs to be done around the governance strategy, all of that should be done as an exchange as well. But Perhaps more interestingly, on the um, market stewardship and the influence side, broadly speaking, um, for us, it would be divided into three components. Number one, around helping the right disclosure to come to the market to support the needs of investors and other stakeholders and to help guide what companies should disclose upon. Um, secondly, engagement and education forms quite a central piece. And I have to admit, sometimes I even feel like we're doing national service for whole of Singapore <laughs> <laughs> in, in the sort of breadth and, uh, and sort of the variety of um, capacity development we do in the market. And um, thirdly, through products and solutions, uh, whether that is helping to promote well, more of um, green solutions, um, you know, broadly speaking, sustainable solutions, are helping the transition, which is really coming into focus in, um, in Singapore and the region overall. Um, in terms of what should inform how that should be done, first of all, um, in our markets, um, we did make um, TCFD disclosure, so climate-related disclosure based upon TCFD mandatory in our markets already from last year. So all of our companies have been well on their journey and sustainability reporting has been mandatory since 2016. So pretty much 100% of companies have sustainability reporting. But now thinking forward on transition plans, uh, this is an area, especially with emerging markets into context, an area that is rapidly going through evolution in terms of what should be a best practice. And therefore, I wholeheartedly agree that we should all look to um, harmonize and make transition plan best practices interoperable as much as possible. From our perspective, whether it be our own transition plan, but perhaps more broadly, those who are operating in Asia or in emerging markets, a few components would be important. So first of all, there would be jurisdictional guidance on what a transition plan should consist of. For example, in Singapore, Monetary Authority of Singapore has given um, heads up to the market that there will be some guidance coming out for financial institutions to follow. Um, because our market will be adopting, I mean, we already have TCFD in place, but because we are looking to adopt ISSB, the components and disclosure related to transition plan is already embedded in ISSB. So there will be... Um, there will be guidance around um, what are the key components of transition plan that needs to be put in place as well as disclosure around that, uh, which would be guided from us as well. It's not only us. Um, I mean, UK for one is doing that and other jurisdictions, but um, Hong Kong Exchange has put something out for ISSB. Um, I think Malaysia is always also looking to do something. So there's already movements that's ongoing. Secondly, a lot of the markets, um, you know, looking at international standards, we do support the work that's already been done around ISSB. So as I mentioned, there will be a rollout. Um, there are key um, 
key elements around strategy in particular on the ISSB, um, S1 and S2 in particular around climate, that that, that explains what the management team ought to do in order to put the key pillars and the key decision-making processes in place, um, including risks and opportunities analysis and, and other. Thirdly, for exchanges, we are going to be taking guidance of the NZFSPA criteria that we have set for the exchanges. Everything that I mentioned is already part of that. And fourthly, of course, of course, the GFAN's guidance for financial institutions and wholeheartedly very happy to hear that it is um, that that work that's been done is being adopted on the UK side already as well. And then we'll look quite closely on all other best practices that emerge. Fantastic. So we really want this uh, panel to be interactive. Please go to the app, the PRI app and go to the breakout uh, A, plenary, plenary A breakout, I think. Um, there is a poll there for you. We want to hear from you. And from now on, there's going to be live Q&A. So if you have any questions for any of the panelists, um, please uh, do submit questions throughout the rest of the session, and I'll, I'll throw them to, to the panelists. Um, you can see, here we go. Yeah. Does your organization currently have a net zero transition plan? Let's see. And then we'll ask another one later on. So. Okay, Publish is winning at the moment. I guess it's like a horse race. I just don't know if I should do live commentary. <laughs> Publish and lead, working on one coming up in the second. No, we're not ready there yet. <laughs> Third. Okay, so a fairly even split. There's one naughty person who will not do it until it is mandatory. <laughs> but as you have heard here today, it's likely to be mandatory. So um, Harry noted uh, in the S2 ISSB guidance, if you read it carefully, it does refer to having a transition plan, um, and many countries around the world have noted their intention to implement the ISSB. Ben, you travel the world in your role, in your role um, both as Oxford and uh, TPT. Could you talk about some of the conversations you're having in Asia and other parts of the world on this issue? Sure, I'm happy to. I mean, I think. I was sort of mentioning that we've been doing a lot of engagement um, in different jurisdictions, particularly in this region. Um, and so the Monetary Authority of Singapore, for example, is an observer to the TPT. And I think um, the, the more we can have that, that conversation and that connectivity between different jurisdictions and regulatory agencies, the more likely it is that we're going to get this consistency that we need. Um, and but I do think one of the one of the issues you you pick up, and I'm sure people are picking it up in conversations here, is um, obviously the pace of the transition and the, the jurisdictional differences. And there's a different view of how quickly we need to, um, how quickly some countries feel that they can get to, to net zero and how we account for geographical differences um, and levels of economic development and so on in, in, in the net zero pathways. Um, and that's, that's something we're gonna have to work really hard to kind of build some capabilities around. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the challenges people flag a lot is, well, we don't have country-specific or region-specific pathways um, to, to, to help create our own net zero transition plans and targets and metrics. Um, and I think that's something where researchers, academics need to, need to respond a bit better to the, to the user community, the people creating um, the models that generate the pathways across sectors and, uh, and across the world for decarbonization. Yeah. How can we break that apart in a consistent way and, and make, make it useful for um, preparers, users in, in Asia, but also in other regions? Yeah, I think the capacity building and the regionalization of pathways are two massive focuses for us and should be for the broader community moving forward. It, similar conversations to the ones I've been having. Um, and the IA obviously published their net zero their updated net zero scenario, which is a good start last last uh, week. I just want to read out the um, results. So we had 30% uh, published, 30% working one, and 35% um, not ready yet, which is, I think, roughly a third, third, third. I think it's good progress. There's 8% who will not do it till mandatory, which is fair enough, and that's why this work is really important to get it into standards, in my view. Um, we have a Q&A here from the audience, which has... Uh, Will Martindale has six upvotes, so well done, Will. Very popular question. Um, TNFD, TPT, and ISSB are all based on the TCFD governance framework. 
Are we moving to a single regulated disclosure for companies, banks, and investors with governance, metrics, and targets across climate, nature, and transition? Um, Harry, given you sit on TNFD and we were chatting about this uh, in the breakout room earlier, do you want to have a first go at that? Yes, I was uh, thinking that there was a previous panel on nature and there's a separate session on TNFD tomorrow, so maybe there's an overload of... Actually, there can never be an overload of nature, so let's go for it. Um, so I, I think that's an ideal place where we want to get to. Um, but if we even look at the way that climate-related disclosure, which is a lot clearer, is being um, sort of practically rolled out, um, you know, in practice, so I guess um, an exchange is in a privileged position sitting in the middle between the financiers and um, companies, real economy companies. That sort of long tail of companies who are not the, you know, supermarket cap companies who are already well on their way, um, those companies, even though we in this room are so well aware of what TCFT is and everything else is, that long tail needs time and it needs guidance and needs support even in rolling out climate alone. Um, and I think each market um, will probably, um, I mean, the, the overall framework is aligned, but how each of the components might consist um, across different jurisdictions and in what time frame across uh, the different themes may vary a um, little bit. So, um, I mean, we thought it was important to be on the TNFD um, task force, and we are the only exchange on that task force as well, so that we can bring some of the color on the ground and some practicalities of how rollout for new themes um, can play out just uh, leaning on previous practices as well. So in a nutshell, ideal place where we want to get to probably will take some time, and we do need to take into account the different various players and sizes and sectors in different regions and jurisdictions, and also how each market would like to play it out. Okay, the, thank you for that. The questions are rolling in thick and fast now. The app is hot. Please keep sending them in. So we're now going to have to shorten our answers. But Ben, you wanted to come in Just, on Just, yeah, very quickly on, on Will's very good question. You know, I think that is where we need to, to get to, particularly or not just on risk, but also in terms of transition planning. One of the things we've done as part of the transition plan task force is to make sure that there are, a, so the focus has been on, on, on mitigation, climate mitigation, but to make sure that where nature, adaptation, just transition is relevant to mitigation, that those are properly uh, accounted for. We've also got working groups in those three other areas, just transition, adaptation, nature. And I think where we should end up is some sort of sustainability, transition planning uh, requirements and processes that look at this in a much more um, integrated way. Uh, and, ho and hopefully that, that's where we get to. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I, think, um, I think there's no net zero without nature. And I think from an investor, financial institution perspective, no one wants to work on 12 different reports. No one wants to read 12 different reports. It's, it's harder to analyze, analyze, it's harder to produce. It makes total sense to integrate it into one um, communication and strategic planning device. Um, lots of questions. Um, this one's quite interesting um, because um, it speaks to theory of change, which is how, and I'm going to ask Tris to answer it, how do you see transition plans in, in, uh, interacting with voting and particularly, say, on climate? Sure, that's a, that's a very good one. So at LGM, when we um, carry out our investment stewardship activities, it's reflected in various functions, but when it comes to the interaction with companies, it's often sit on our voting um, activity and also the direct engagement or collaborative engagement. And we are very transparent with our vote um, expectations. So for example, on the transition plan, we do have uh, a public uh, document state what our expectation on a say on climate red lines um, for companies, right? So in very explicit way, we encourage company to have a public commitment on net zero by 2050, disclose the short-term, medium, and long-term scope one and two and material scope three emission. We also um, encourage them to have a credible um, target aligned with the 1.5 trajectory, um, either verified by SB at, 
SBTI or other independent parties, right? So should a company's say on climate co um, proposal fall short of this, that would result us a vote um, against. So, and we also have our vote disclosure website, which published the vote rationale and is updated 24 hours, right? So often we get questions from our investing company ahead of AGM and EGM. Can we talk about that? We say, sorry, thanks, because our expectations are all on our website and you are able to also review our historical vote on your resolution and see what is our position. So we made it very transparent and loud and clear to the company. And of course, when it comes to the actual transition plan, we do recognize that it will be very unique to the context of company because it has to be integrated to their business. So for us, it's the position that we would recommend reference to all the frameworks, mm -hmm. but then company is in their leadership position to set up a strategy um, and then referencing various like um, TCFD that just announced uh, TNFD, ISSB, et cetera. Yeah. So we see for example, using TPT as an example, that will be setting up the, the first tier of the strategy level that outline the commitment, the target, etc. TCFD sits in the middle part, uh, mostly about the risks and opportunities, right? And then you use science-based target to have the science-backed um, consideration, which is uh, integrates three portions the company has to consider to make the plan reliable and then also committable. It's not just on the paper, but we, as an investor, we want to see how companies act driving their internal business decision. May it comes to M&A, may it come to divestment, product new development, innovation, etc. Associated those elements, and that's the let's say very rounded consideration we would take into. I think that uh, links back to what Ben was saying earlier that you're going to see net zero transition plans be a part of voting, yeah. procurement requirements, uh, regulatory subsidy conversations. So it's going to be into like. Yeah integral to every type Absolutely. of investor and private sector real economy actor, I think. And that links to our second uh, question, go back into the app. Um, how long do you expect until your regulator or supervisor requires a net zero transition plan? Can we get that on the screen, please? Well, if you, you, yeah, here we go. So one to two years is leading um, with 40%, two to five, 30%. They already do 15%. I do not think they ever will, 13%. I think one Trump supporter snuck in and said, I'm not going to publish a transition plan until I'm forced to, and I never will be forced to. But that, I think it's quite telling that 80% expect uh, their supervisor to be requiring this in the next one to two years, um, because that suggests that you should be getting ahead of the curve, I think, and because they are quite difficult things to grapple around. Um, I think we have time for one last question from the audience, so I'll take the one with the most upvotes, which is Kim Earls. From a practical perspective, how do SMEs begin, given a scarcity of resources and a lack of literacy and sophistication around climate? Does anyone have to take a go at that? But Ben? Well, I mean, obviously that's a hard one, but I think we need to start actually with the banking sector. You know, the banks mm -hmm. have a really important role to play in supporting SMEs, um, and they can do that in a variety of different ways. But that, that's, I, I think we, you know, and there are there are sort of moves afoot, I think, to get banks to do, do more in this area, but there's probably a lot more coordination that could be done internationally. Um, I think part of this is also about things like um, open data standards. Uh, so, you know, SMEs um, be able to shop around for, financial products and services um, that can support them in their transition and not have to kind of, you know, do very uh, onerous disclosures to, 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 to different banks. They could do one common kind yeah. of bit of reporting and then that's used um, by, by different banks to provide services. I think that's right. I think we've been working with a lot of our banks that have huge SME books. 50 to 60% of their book is SME uh, bank, corporate banking and they've de de uh, developed a number of tools to help uh, their SME clients disclose automatically, basically based on their um, data, which I think, so I think banks, I think um, local kind of chambers of commerce can also help as well and government support. Um, well, thank you very much for participating. Thank you for all of your questions. Sorry we can get through, through them. Thank you to um, our wonderful panelists. It's been a really interesting conversation. Um, we're going to head over to the Nippon Life uh, stand to continue this conversation. So if anyone has any burning questions, there's about uh, 15, 16 more questions that we couldn't get through. Please do head over. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. What day was first game to? Wow. No, yeah. we have until uh, that clock was funny. Hello, guys. Sorry, please stay. <laughs> I got the timing completely wrong. We've got another 20 minutes. <laughs> and we have 15 questions. Please. I wasn't lying. Please come back. We were hoping they were Sit down. Minute, right? so you're Sorry still... about the bad news. I uh, thought they finished at 12. Um, yeah. So, fantastic moderation. I've never seen it before. Just I trust up. you. I, I... <laughs> Fantastic. I also got the moderation turned off in the app, so I was like, oh, they're clearly annoyed that I'm talking too much. But here we go. The next most question is from Professor Ben Caldercourt, who ran back. And you might need to lower your mic as well. <laughs> Professor Ben Caldercourt mentioned external impact in transition planning. What is the role of double materiality in transition reporting and disclosures? <laughs> um, so, look, I think, I, I think the... <laughs> Uh, just getting my composure back. <laughs> so, the, the, the way I did I, say I was going to do this in the pre brief, just <laughs> close the panel, yeah. run back on, ask another question. <laughs> um, so, I, so, so, you know, transition plans, I think, are a, you know, are a way of essentially maximizing the impact that, that entities can have on the world. Um, and obviously, the focus here has been on the net, net zero carbon transition. Um, it can extend to, to everything else. And we talked a bit of, about, about that before. But I think it's a way of thinking, actually, thinking about, OK, as a, as a company, as a financial institution, what are the levers available to me to make a difference in the world? And how do I pull those levers and get better at pulling them to make a difference. And the levers you have to pull are going to be different depending on where you are in the world and your place in the ecosystem. But this is something that companies and financial institutions aren't very good at doing. And uh, if we're going to change the world and tackle climate change and reduce and stop biodiversity loss, um, uh, companies and financial institutions are going to have to get really good at this. And this links back to the point about theories of change. You know, you need a theory of change. And, and this is a way of developing a consistent theory of change that can then be assessed by multiple different users, including your, your investors. So that's the sort of mindset change we need to, to get into. Um, and although it doesn't, we don't talk specifically about theories of change, I think that is you know, essentially what you're going to need to do. Harry? Yeah, so um, again, I just want to go back to this uh, transition plan being something that's completely new out there. Anyone who's been working on TCFD, you've already been looking at this materiality. Every sustainability report has it. We, we made that one of the key components from the beginning 2016 for companies to have a materiality analysis. Now, um, if we just see our, our, um, our markets, um, because back in 2016, the, the one standard that started to get global adoption was GRI. And so today, like 99% of our market utilize GRI, which um, um, asks companies uh, in their uh, materiality analysis to look at both sides. TCFD, I think most companies who do that analysis look at both you know, strategy and risk management component from both sides as well. Um, as we as we move into SASB and um, ISSB, this is where um, I think there is a bit more of a view towards investors, as you would probably all be aware. I do like the way that um, the task force deliberated on um, this particular topic when it came to TNFD, in fact, um, because the way that it gets rolled out actually would also depend on the market, um, and it's something that that different jurisdictions will adopt over time. So TNFD had actually created materiality topics such that it, um, the, the framework can be utilized for both uh, financial materiality, if I can put it that way, as well as uh, double materiality. And it, the, the wording isn't even that way. But um, <laughs> at the end of the day, it goes back down to just real world impact. So if your company, um, the, the companies in your portfolio as well as yourselves, if you're trying to look at the real world impact and decrease in the emissions, the materiality should inform of that particular strategic direction that you ought to go. 
There's a few things I want to pull out um, from the question and your answers. One is uh, your point that if you've been doing a TCFD report and you have um, targets, then you're very far along the way to actually having a transition plan. And there's a question here about the quality of current transition plans. This is the first year net zero transition plans have been published. And we had the same experience with 10 years of TCFD where they got better every year. And you shouldn't not do a transition plan because it's not perfect. I don't think anyone who's published a transition plan this year would say, my transition plan is complete, it's finished, they're living documents, they're iterative. Um, the thing about quality and double materiality, I think, relates to the metrics and targets section of a transition plan. What are you actually targeting? You mentioned, uh, Trista, on your opening, 70% uh, of your assets yep. under management will be aligned with net zero by, or aiming to be aiming aligned to be. <laughs> by 2030. That's actually a pretty punchy target. And that's where the impact in the net zero transition plan comes from. And the, the net zero alliances, whether it's the asset manager alliance, asset owners, banking alliance, they all have um, quite detailed target setting protocols about what it means to target net zero. Obviously, they also have provisions that say, we're not gonna achieve these very ambitious science-based targets unless governments yep. follow through with their targets and their policies. Because particularly if you're a large financial institution, you can't diversify out of your economy by much more than a small delta. So that's why a lot of our approaches are about working with governments, working with companies, working with scientists on sectoral pathways, like Ben was saying, because it needs that multi-actor, multi-dimensional collaborative approach to deliver the change we need to achieve net zero, whether you're, a, whether you're an economy or whether you're a financial institution. Yeah. So, if I can just add yes, on please. that, in fact, in our own transition plan report, we've outlined two very explicit risk and uncertainties. And the first point is exactly as you mentioned, the dependency on the global transitions. Right? We are one of the players in the global market. And then for us to make our own commitment, we will often rely on a lot of policymakers. So where we engage heavily with policymakers and regulators, in fact, stock exchange is one of our engagement target just to drive that changes together. But we also recognize that should that not happening, we would need to adjust our target, right? The second point is the rapid social change. I think we haven't touched upon um, the people factor as, uh, as uh, like clearly, explicitly in the conversation here. But we do recognize that, for example, the climate change, maybe the transition change, um, physical climate risk, will come with an impact on the people factor, right? So those will be something that we are very cognizant about in taking into consideration and where we can focus on where we can control. We are acting as a larger player in, in together and driving that. Yeah, I want to pick up on that because Catherine Bolger with seven thumbs ups asked specifically on that question. Okay. Uh, just transition is key in moving to net zero. Yeah. How are you considering the need for fossil fuel intense companies to report to investors how they are engaging with their workers and communities on transition and apportioning capital to support workers in the transition? I'll have a first go at this one because we're doing a lot of work on this. Um, so take a con uh, an emerging market that's very, very fossil fuel dependent, Indonesia. We're involved in supporting um, the Just Energy Transition Partnership. So that's a private, public, uh, 20 billion commitment to support the country to move from a heavily coal dependent energy system to renewables with quite um, ambitious targets in it, but very much with just transition, support for workers, support for affordable energy at the heart of it. Um, now that's just a one country approach, but we want to see that really integrated approach between workers, communities, affordable energy um, rolled out across the world. So I w wondered if um, any of you wanted to comment on how to integrate just transition um, and particularly support for hard to abate sectors um, in, in transition planning. Thank you. I can start first. Yeah. Um, so to start with, uh, the, the SIP sector that I mentioned earlier already has included that question in one of the, um, the conversation that we will have with company one-on-one. -on -one. Um, while the just transition is uh, the, 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 basically is the human side and then the climate side, right? So, so like you mentioned that we are very much encouraging company to, to address this through dialogues, through conversations with both their workers, the communities, um, and also look into the, the potential opportunity to, to reskill the workers that could potentially be impacted. 
um, there was a panel that a uh, site event that I attended yesterday about uh, the avoid silo conversation between human rights and climate change. I think that is explicitly calling out the impact of that. And for companies going through the high emission sector um, decarbonization journey, inevitable, they will have let's say, a large amount of the workforce that will be impacted should the fossil fuel phase out, right? So how actively, not just for the recruiting in the pipeline with the society, but also the skill set repurposing, that would be quite critical and working, and, and nobody would be available, I mean, able to achieve that working in silos. So we we'll highly encourage company to work with different stakeholders um, in their very strict jurisdiction in, into, into this consideration. And we are finalizing our just transition explicit expectation. So perhaps next round we can share a bit more on that. Yeah. Just to just to jump in though, I mean I think um, you know, obviously the transition is, is going to be so disruptive for so many different sectors. Uh, de decarbonizing in the space of less than thirty years, uh, you know, the political economy issues are going to be very significant. And I think we've got to be realistic about what individual companies can do in some of these sectors, and also what investors can do through engagement with those companies. I mean, this is, mm -hmm. so this is a massive public policy issue. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this community should have a much clearer view of what are the interventions, what are the policy interventions that are needed generally to support a just transition. And some of that's about labor market flexibility and providing training opportunities for people, um, student loans, all this sort of stuff generally and then very specifically what are the interventions in specific sectors specific communities that need need to be made to to ensure the transition can happen in a in a just way but also in a way that's politically sustainable exactly um i think um if you look at the gfans transition plan framework it explicitly has four buckets of what we consider net zero aligned finance so the first two are fairly obvious the uh, climate solutions and financing that for companies that are aligned to a 1.5 degree pathways. So kind of the type of finance that is traditionally covered by green taxonomies. The fourth bucket is a managed phase out of stranded assets. And we've published some guidance on how investors, how banks can lend, invest in the early, um, early closure in a managed just way of coal fired power plants. The interesting one is the third bucket. So companies, which I think is the thrust of this question, that are committed to aligning with a 1.5 degree or a net zero pathway, but they're not there yet. And I think this is the whole discussion that was alluded to earlier around transition finance. And I imagine if you're here next year, wherever the PRI in person is on a panel, there's gonna be a panel on how do we better define what transition finance is because it's necessary. There's no, there's not a single scientific pathway to 1.5 degree that has, doesn't have huge investment in hard to abate sectors. So your steel, your cement, your agriculture, big fossil fuel demanders currently. So we need investment to increase if we're going to achieve net zero. That's going to have a big impact on your finance emissions. Your finance emissions are going to go up. So we need to augment our target setting um, frameworks for net zero for financial institutions. That's what we're trying to do at the moment. We published a consultation on it last week at New York Climate Week. And I, but I think there's a risk here as well with how do you make sure that that transition finance to currently heavy emitters is actually being used for decarbonization and it's not just being used for business as usual. And that's what, that's what, what the transition plans are, exactly. are for, right? Exactly. Because we, we've also got to be honest with ourselves about you know, the fact that not every company in a hard debate sector is going to be able to successfully transition. Yeah. And, you know, you, you don't want to have lots of stranded assets. You want to differentiate and, and, and back the plans that are credible and going to deliver. Yeah. Um, just again, just re-stressing the link back to the real economy. There is no way we can transition and, uh, and, and not have a just component to it if we actually look at the starting point today. So if we, as um, those in the finance community, investors out there, take into consideration where is that particular jurisdiction at today and not necessarily, I mean, of course, divestment is one strategy, but if you were to sit there and engage, um, you know, that should be the starting point and the financing instruments, which is the products and services that is a component of the transition plan to articulate how are you financing and engaging with the community using financing as well. So then that leads back to in much of the emerging markets where it is, in particular for SMEs as well, it is going to be 
surprise, surprise, a cost uh, to an extent, right? Either CapEx or OPEX. So you will need to um, support this. So how we are thinking about it from exchange perspective is how do we um, support the companies for them to identify what kind of, um, you know, technological choices, a pathway that they would have as a company in that sector. And if there is a delta between um, funding that can deliver on what needs to be financed and not, then what is the gap? And um, it's tough, but, you know, where does blended finance come in? And where does it come in at scale from capital markets perspective? So there are some innovations that we're seeing in the market where um, sort of the the low return, you know, anchor tranches for companies in emerging markets or credit rating enhancements, these kind of structures are coming in to support companies. Um, but it's, it's, you, we just really have to start at where are the companies at if you are invested in that particular market and how do you actually finance that? Great. So we unfortunately have to wrap up for real this time. I won't call you back as a, as a joke. Um, I did want to just finish by saying, if, you do, if you're an investor and you're doing your ICAPs in, in the investor agenda or NZAM or wherever you sit, you are on your way to doing a transition plan. You might, you might already be further along. The, so it's a yeah. point Harry made at the start. If you're doing TCFD, if you're setting targets, if you're engaging with ICAPs, you're probably further along this journey than, than you realize. And it's really important, given all the conversation we had about that, that this is likely coming down the regulatory road quite soon. You saw, I think it was a, up to 80% of people thought within two years, this might be a supervisory expectation in your jurisdiction. It's better to be ahead of the curve. Start, start doing transition planning, start publishing, start talking about it, start talking about it with your portfolio companies. Um, I hope it's been interesting for you. We're for real going to the Nippon <laughs> Live stand now to carry on the conversation. Um, and we hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.